Happy Thursday and welcome to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keeft in the studios of 89.3 Lakes FM and Civic Center TV. As always, today we are joined on Birmingham Area Municipal Access, also on Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99, as well as on 88.1 FM The Biff. And today, our Facebook partner is Oakland University, broadcasting live on their Facebook page via Facebook Live. As always, I'm joined from her home studio by Ronnie Dahl. Uh, Tyler, what a Wednesday, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, President Trump officially impeached for a second time and then on top of that we had former governor rick snyder uh charges were filed against him due to the flint water crisis and we we're expecting dana nessel the attorney general for the state of michigan to announce more details regarding those charges a little bit later today i believe she's going to be holding a press conference around 11:30. So the president impeached for a second time and our former governor charged in the Flint water crisis. Boy, 2021 has started off with a bang, right? Yeah, it's looking at us like, oh, 2020, you think you're so great. Here I come in with an impeachment, an attack at the at the at the uh, U.S. Capitol, uh, the governor, former governor of Michigan, getting hit with charges for the Flint water crisis. Bring it on. I mean, I mean, this is it's interesting start. Not to say the least. Yeah, so I and, and there are going to be other members of the Snyder administration yes. that are expected to be charged as well. I didn't take the time to go through all the court documents. I just uh, searched for Snyder's name and I posted those charges uh, on my Facebook pages if anyone wants to see the actual court documents. Uh, but for some people, they believe this is a long time coming. But again, those charges are misdemeanors uh, for, um, a, you know, I believe it was a uh, violation of conduct in office or something of that nature. So they were misdemeanors, two misdemeanors that the governor, former governor is facing in the, win uh, the Flint water crisis. And for a lot of people, they feel like that's not enough. Yeah, a lot of people are going to be upset with just uh, th those pretty minor crimes being what uh, what the governor is being accused of and, of and charged of in this case, considering the impact that the Flint water crisis has continued to have on the people of, of Flint, those affected by by that lead poisoned water. Um, a lot of people are probably going to be very frustrated, think maybe the governor is, the former governor is getting off easy in this, in this case, uh, due to the fact that he's just being charged, as you said, with a simple misdemeanor. And uh, Tyler, did you get a chance to watch any of the proceedings in D.C. yesterday for the impeachment hearings? I did. I did watch the proceedings. I, I saw about 20 minutes or so of it as uh, as the two political parties in the House were deliberating on whether or not they were going to support the the president's second impeachment and then, uh, and then tuned back in right around the time of the vote and then just before the Sylvan Lake City Council meeting last night uh, saw House Speaker Nancy Pelosi uh, formally signed the, the impeachment documents uh, and then quickly end that uh, press conference event. So again, Trump was impeached for inciting an insurrection. We are going to have Representative Brenda Lawrence on with us in the 11 o'clock hour of the show today to talk a little bit more about the impeachment, but also all of the events that have unfolded in the nation's capital over the previous week. We were hoping to have Andy Levin with us yesterday. However, due to those hearings, uh, we were not able to get him on the show, but I did see his speech uh, yesterday, his brief speech uh, during uh, the impeachment hearings and here in the state of Michigan. And, and obviously we did see it was not, but there were some bipartisan participation yesterday in the impeachment proceedings. In fact, there were two Michigan Republicans that went across party lines and they also voted for the impeachment of the president of the United States. Yeah, that was that was a surprise, certainly, to see as many people that did flip parties uh, as they as they did yesterday during that vote. Uh, certainly, we had two people from the state of Michigan, 10 total people people from the Republican Party who did flip to vote in favor of impeachment in the House. It was expected before that it, as many as seven people 
uh, had publicly said that they were going to support the impeachment of Donald Trump despite, all, despite being fellow Republicans. Um, and it ended up being that final number being at 10. Uh, and now the interesting question is when the Senate does take this on, whether that is before they reconvene on the 19th, which uh, Senate Majority Leader for now and, and soon to be Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell has said is not going to be the case. Will there be enough people in that in the Senate once this does go to a a Senate trial? Will there be that 17 that, that that's those 17 senators from the other party to flip over on Don, on Donald Trump and convict him, and no and nobody from the Democratic Party flipping uh, republic in favor of Republican and not convicting Donald Trump uh, when this does eventually go to the Senate. I will say this is really kind of a fascinating time <laughs> to if you just want to take a back seat to all of this and watch everything that's been playing out <laughs> it really is kind of a fascinating time so we will be speaking with uh dave dulio a little bit later in the show as well about so much that is going on of course he's a professor of political science over at uh, oakland university and uh, i would love to get his take on this as well but if we can go ahead and jump into uh, today's headlines, uh, Tyler. Uh, Oakland County residents can now reserve a spot for the COVID-19 vaccine. So um, any resident that is included in that phase 1C of the state's COVID-19 vaccination plan, you cannot yet make an appointment due to the limited supply, but you can now reserve a spot in line when the vaccine becomes more widely available. Beginning, beginning Monday, state health officials uh, moved into the next phase of the vaccination phase 1C to include residents 65 years of age and over. Uh, along with that, uh, teachers as well as the staff and child care workers and other frontline workers, appointments are being limited due to the vaccine supply right now on a county by county basis. But county residents here in Oakland County in the next phase, the best thing for you to do is go to oaklandcountyvaccine.com to reserve a spot in line for when the county receives enough vaccine doses to begin making those appointments. This is a frustrating process and we understand that and our officials understand that as well. So this at least will hopefully relieve a little bit of that frustration level. Uh, countywide, there are over 217,000 residents age 65 and older that would be eligible to receive the vaccine and the phase 1C of the vaccination. And of course, we are not at that level of the supply. So demand is outweighing the supply chain, but they are hoping to get more of that supply in the coming days and coming weeks as well. So this is kind of a, a, a good workaround that Oakland County is coming up with, Tyler. Yeah, this is one of the this is one of those things that I think down the road the people of Oakland County will really appreciate because as you open people as you open the phases up to people being able to go and actually get vaccinated, there's going to be that demand there and there's a chance of there being a rush to make an appointment and to make a reservation. Which could, which could, like we see in many other cases with with technology, with things that require that require going to a certain website at a certain time when things open up, that often these things crash. And having people reserve spots for Phase One C before Phase One C comes to a point where they are getting ready to be able to get go get, get vaccinated at a scheduled appointment. You maybe reduce that kind of traffic and then make things a lot easier and smoother when you do get to the point where people in phase 1C are being vaccinated that some people already have reservations, their appointments will be first in line and everybody else will be, will be coming in at that point to schedule their appointments if they weren't able to make a reservation in advance at this time. Yeah, and it, you, we all just need to have a little patience yes. during this time as well. I, I mean, it's kind of the same thing that we went through in the beginning. We couldn't get testing. Now testing is available, but however, the vaccine is going to take a while uh, to catch up with the demand. Uh, Whitmer hopes to reopen, hopes, that's hopes. the key word, to reopen restaurants for dine-in service uh, beginning of February 1st. So she is uh, extending the dine-in ban yet again 
Although the governor said state leaders hope to reopen the restaurants on February 1st when the latest extension does expire. So if Michigan's COVID-19 numbers keep declining, Whitmer said indoor dining may be allowed to restart on the 1st with mask requirements, capacity limits, and a curfew. We pretty much alerted you to that information yesterday. Now, more restrictions have been lifted though under the latest order, which goes into effect on Saturday. Indoor fitness classes and non-contact sports can restart while indoor dining, water parks, and nightclubs are among the sectors that are still closed. Michigan residents laid off during the latest partial shutdown are eligible for up to $1,600 uh, from, uh, from the state as part of a $45 million program. Impacted businesses are also eligible for up to $20,000 from the state. This is part of how Michigan is propping up the hospitality industry that has been forced to shut down, Whitmer said. Let's be honest, $20,000 for a business if you've not been able to reopen during this time, because while a lot of people are saying, hey, carry out still available, they're, they're still doing businesses. There are a lot of businesses that have closed because the carry out business wasn't enough to support and maintain you know, the bills that keep coming in, such as trying to keep the lights on and paying the staff and things of that nature. $20,000 is kind of a slap in the face, I think. And that's up to, by the way, up to. Right, yeah, up, up to $20,000. It's not going to go a long way. Maybe it helps a little bit with the bills, but like you said, it's not enough to cover them. It's not enough to make up for the losses that have been there. Um, so, so, I mean, it's one of those situations where it's thanks, but no thanks also because we've been closed for so long that this money is not, it, it's helpful but it's not immensely helpful as it's probably being perceived as at the state level. In terms of hoping to reopen on February 1st, I, I, st I still think that that's a little bit of, of a stretch, not having it be definitively said, yes, we will be reopening these on February 1st. It's a hope, it's a hope to, and, and, uh, and we have tomorrow on the show Bloomfield Hills School Superintendent Pat Watson, and whenever he's mentioned in a sentence, we are legally required on this program to, to mention hope is not a plan. He, this hope that things are going to reopen on February 1st, that's not necessarily a definitive date. Nothing's been a definitive date during this pause. And that on top of the relatively light relief being given to these businesses by the state, it, it's probably not going to make them very happy in this situation. Thrilled that they may reopen, but may reopen versus will reopen is a significant difference. So the state of Michigan, by the way, uh, we're one of only three states right now that still has a ban on indoor dining. Um, and, and so that kind of goes into our next story here, uh, Tyler. The Senate Republicans are considering rejecting Whitmer's appointees until the coronavirus restrictions are completely lifted. So, uh, so as she announced the continuation of the statewide indoor restaurant dining ban, Frustrated Senate Republicans have floated the possibility of rejecting appointees until the COVID-19 related closures cease. Michigan is one of only three states with a statewide ban on indoor dining. That's according to the Michigan Restaurant and Lodging Association. Many of the governor's appointments to state boards and commissions are subject to advice and consent of the Senate, meaning the Senate has the authority to reject eligible appointees uh, within 60 days. So should the Senate follow through, the move could affect dozens of appointments to university boards and state commissions Whitmer has made over the last few months and could also have implications on future appointments. So it's one way that our Senate Republicans are trying to fight back on this issue. Yeah, it's it's another it's another example of, of politics taking taking it, it its toll throughout this pandemic, and you know if they they reject to the governor's decisions, they are going to use whatever powers they can to try to negotiate some of these decisions to be taken in a different direction. Whether or not that ends up working out uh, for these Senate Republicans and they get exactly what they want out of this, with all restrictions being lifted, I'm going to go ahead and doubt that. But this is a starting point for them. This threat that they're going to reject 
the governor's appointees until she lifts all restrictions. It's definitely a strategically a starting point to say, hey, come back to the negotiating table. You want these people appointed. Let's do We're going to give you what you want if you give us a little bit of what we want, and we want some of these restrictions to be lifted. So this is probably not the, not the last time we're going to be hearing about this particular issue of whether or not the Senate Republicans at the state level will appoint, will, uh, will approve the governor's appointees and how that negotiation that may or may not happen between the governor's office and the Senate Republicans in Michigan may impact coronavirus restrictions going forward. Uh, let's just say, I think um, the governor's office gets like a D when it comes to trying to uh, communi communicate with the public behind some of their decision making. If I hear her say one more time, uh, you know, um, the science and the data, you've got to provide the science and the data. We've also seen them throughout this process roll out these new mandates, especially through the health department, with no... Uh, details as to how they're actually going to in, enact it and how it's going to work. And that includes, I remember back in the day, it was like, hey, all the restaurants now have to keep a log of everyone that comes into the restaurant for contact tracing. Well, okay, there are details with that. Who does that? Is it legal? What if they give a fake name? How do you secure that information? Who's responsible for that information? So I feel like we are 10 months plus into this and they still haven't gotten the PR side of this. Um, it, it, it just blows my mind as someone that used to work for um, a federal agency as a public information officer, you think through this process, you go A, B, C, D, and E. And let's work through it together because one of the big things that has come out during this and the pushback has been, she hasn't provided the science and the data to the public to show that there are these outbreaks. Because if you go to the dashboard provided by the state of Michigan, the dashboard shows that uh, there aren't a lot of outbreaks that are related to restaurants. And um, maybe that's just how the information is being collected. I don't know, uh, but that's one of the issues too, because there's been a lot of fuzziness in the data. Uh, as we uncover and we continue to go through this crisis as well, Tyler. Yeah, it's clear that COVID-19 is a problem in the state of Michigan as it is throughout the rest of the country. It's clear that we need to be taking strong actions against COVID-19 to reduce the number of new cases, to keep those numbers low, especially now that we're in a phase where we can sort of see an end to this oncoming and how we react in these times are going to determine, it's going to determine when and, and, and how we get to that end point. But information is, is necessary for the, the public to understand why these decisions are being made, for fellow lawmakers even to understand why these decisions are being made and how they are impacting the state's response to COVID-19. To COVID and having the science and the data and, and having that dictate how these decisions are being made is fine, but if you're not showing them to people, no, there's going to be a significant portion of the population that simply is not going to believe them or is going to see that as, as you have something to hide. So if that science and that data does support that, hey, these decisions need to be, need to be made, they need to be made in this, in this way, and here's how we are predicting that this data is going to be impacted by that, then that's something you do want to be able to at least, you want to be at least sharing with your fellow leaders in Lansing, if not, and in, in more importantly, to the public as well. Well, because at the end of the day, it's our data. Correct. We pay for their salaries. Correct. But I will say, uh, so I'm going back to Ohio this weekend uh, to continue to work on our mom's house. And I'm excited because I'm like already thinking about the restaurants I can eat in. <laughs> I'm like so excited to be able to eat at a restaurant because Ohio doesn't have the same restrictions that we have here in the state of Michigan. And way back in the beginning of this, I also crossed the border to be able to get my nails done. <laughs> so, you know, we are close enough that we're able to do that. Um, but I also wonder, what is it like to be a business that's like right over the state border in the state of Michigan? Um, you know, like in the Moreau. Yeah. <laughs> and your friends over like two miles away can be open, but you can't. <laughs> it's got to be frustrating. Yeah, it's got to be frustrating. And I'm sure those businesses that are able to be open 
as you said, those two miles over the border in the state of Ohio are probably appreciating a lot of the business that they're getting crossing over from the state of the state of Michigan uh, as these restrictions continue on and as new restrictions are put in place here. Um, and I'm sure that vice versa, if those rules were reversed at some point uh, during the pandemic earlier or in the future where Ohio, where Ohio's restrictions are impacted and people come to Michigan for certain services that they would also be pretty, those businesses would also be pretty appreciative of that crossover. Yeah, but we've been much uh, stricter yes. than the state of Ohio throughout this entire pandemic. So, uh, so many uh, facets to this, 10 plus months into this, and we are still navigating it. When will it end? I feel like I'm in Groundhog's Day. However, things are changing, and we are going to take a quick break here on the Oakland County Megacast, but we have a great lineup for you on this Thursday. When we come back, we'll be speaking with Dave Dulio. He's a professor of political science and the director for the Center of Center of Civic Engagement over at Oakland University. He's really our political expert. So many things to talk about with him. I always enjoy and appreciate his insight. Then we'll also be speaking with the uh, communications and marketing director for Forgotten Harvest about the issue of so many Americans are still continuing to go hungry during this pandemic and we'll talk to them about some of the updated efforts that they are taking to try to serve the people here in the metro detroit area and then in the 11 o'clock hour at the top of the 11 we'll be bringing in brenda lawrence who is the u.s representative for michigan's 14th congressional district and those are just a few of the guests on today's edition of the oakland county megacast michigan we're calling on you to save lives don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19, to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson, and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Park's COVID-19 help hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet, wear facial coverings when you leave your home, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. taking time out of your Thursday to be with us here on the Oakland County Megacast. You can always catch Tyler and I Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. until noon on Civic Center TV, Birmingham Area Municipal Access, Channel 15 on Comcast 99 if you have AT&T. And then if you're out driving around, 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 FM, the BIP on the radio. We also want to say thank you to Oakland University for allowing us to live stream today's edition of the Megacast on their Facebook page. And with that, let's jump into the show. Joining us today is going to be Dave Dulio, Professor of Political Science and Director for the Center for Civic Engagement at Oakland University. I will say a happy new year to you, 2021. What a year.
It does appear we are having some issues with David Dulio here on the phone. Um, let me just take a quick look here. Something's not entirely right. Um, let's see. David, can you hear us on the phone? does appear we are not getting any return level for me. You know, let's, Ronnie, let's take another break here. Let's try to Larry if we can. David, are you there? Yeah, it appears we are having some trouble getting him on. Let's take a quick break again, Ronnie, and then Larry, if you can uh, call David and see if he can call into our Zoom for this particular meeting. Sorry about that. We will take another quick break here on the Oakland County Megacast and try to get this situated. Something not quite right, it appears, with our phone lines. It seems as though... Uh, David Dulio cannot hear us. So we'll take another quick break and come back with more. You are watching and listening the Oakland, to the Oakland County Megacast. Seem uncomfortable, but so is being hooked to an IV, sleeping in a hospital bed, and fighting for your life. When it comes to COVID-19, comfort is not as important as saving lives. Wearing a mask can greatly reduce the chance of spreading the virus. So mask up, Michigan, every time you leave home. The only way to beat COVID-19 is to face it. You can't get too comfortable. You can't forget the danger. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wash your hands. Keep a safe distance, especially in the next few months you know we'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. Someday. But not yet. Not yet. Not yet. But not yet. But not yet. Consider virtual gatherings for the holidays. Curbside food order. Grocery delivery. And shopping local. Shop local. And especially shopping local. Let's beat this virus. We can if we face it together. 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 For the latest information, visit oakgov.com forward slash COVID. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test. And now it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so. Those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. Our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, we've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward, not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Don't go away. More of the Oakland County Megacast in just a minute. We'll be back with David Dulio from Oakland University. Perry tested positive for COVID-19. Emma was exposed to a friend who's positive. Willa's waiting on test results. After any contact with COVID-19, or if you test positive, stay home for at least 10 days. If you live with others, keep your distance and wear a mask. Help Michigan contain COVID-19. Visit michigan.gov slash contain COVID. Uh, for the technical glitch but you know what this is what happens in this new pandemic age before i will tell you um uh, when i was a member of mainstream media things like that would make you freak out so oh, i yeah. started as a producer and i'd be in the booth and you'd be like oh my gosh oh my gosh oh my gosh now you're just like yeah it happens because think about it like while it's happening to us what's happening like all across the world right now, like in classrooms or courtrooms or <laughs> heaven help, like in, in telehealth, you know, these are the things that we deal with now and you take it with a grain of salt and we move on. Yeah, so, with- yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, we, uh, 
here in the studios, we're, we're trying to get some things ready for other productions this, this week. And so I think a couple of things got crossed with our phone lines. And so we may have been able to hear David Dulio on the line, but he wasn't able to hear us. And so we had to do some more things behind the scenes to get him going. But we're all set now, Ronnie, aren't we? Hey, Professor, how are you? Thanks for being with us. Good morning, Ronnie and Tyler. My apologies for uh, having to do this by phone and, and, and causing you all sorts of technical oh, difficulties. Okay. But I had them on my own end. Uh, Wi-Fi was not being cooperative today. So, you know, it's, it's one of those new normal uh, hurdles that we have to get over, I guess. Look, it happens. We're all good with right. it. Right. Uh, but with that, I hope you actually had cable to be able to uh, tune in to the proceedings that happened yesterday. What a start to the new year. Uh, right. Boy, we all were hoping that uh, and counting on that uh, 21 uh, would be better than 20. And, uh, boy, that is not the case uh, so far, at least in terms of politics. So if we can just start off maybe um, with the things that unfolded at the nation's capital yesterday. I always love your perspective because the one thing I wonder about is he has less than a week in office. So by the time they actually, the issue gets to the Senate to be able to take a vote, he's already going to be out of office. So why even do this? Well, I think that's a fair question. Um, and I think, you know, for, for, this, for this conversation, we, we have to go back to the events of January 6th. And, and, and I think that, that the, the riot that occurred on Capitol Hill uh, frankly shook uh, the, the political landscape in America uh, like it hasn't been for, for a long, long time. And, and I think that, that obviously that's what started uh, us on this path. And, and I think even then you, you, you saw very quickly Republicans and Democrats in a, in a rare moment of agreement um, condemn and, and blast and just repudiate what happened uh, in terms of the, the rioters. Uh, somebody who spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill and, and having worked there for, for a bit, um, you know, I, 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 that place is, a, is, is sacred to many in, uh, in U.S. politics, and, and it was desecrated. Um, and I think that that's what pushed uh, for this next impeachment to happen, obviously. And, and then we start to get further and further removed from it. And then we sort of, we, and what we see is, is, the, um, is our elected officials move into their partisan corners again. And you end up with, um, with sort of where we're at today with, with the uh, vote yesterday. Um, Ten Republicans cross over and vote to impeach Donald Trump. The rest of them uh, vote against it. Um, you do have individuals like uh, Kevin McCarthy, the Republican leader, uh, say that um, uh, it, it, he accused the president of inciting that riot, and but he didn't want to vote to impeach him. So we, we you know, some, so maybe some of them are caught in the middle somehow. Um, but we're we're back in our partisan corners, and the, the as you noted, right, the Senate's not going to take it up until at least January nineteenth, the day before the president leaves office. So, uh, and I think you're going to see at that point a lot of Americans say, well, what the heck are we doing? Uh, he's gone. That's what we wanted in the first place. And let's get on to um, the, the real, you know, not the, let's get on to the, the next problem uh, in the country. Because we have to remember, we are still in the middle of a pandemic. There is a crisis that is ongoing. People are going hungry. They're being evicted from their homes. They are losing their jobs. They are losing their businesses. And so for some people, they may argue you, this is taking away from the focus of trying to get our country back on the right track. I think you'll, you'll see those kinds of, of calls uh, very quickly after, uh, after the, the Senate takes up this impeachment in, in later in January. And I think it's a fair point. I, I, you know, I, I think that what occurred on January 6th was, was so terrible. Um, that I think it's defensible to make the other argument that, hey, look, this was so bad, we have to, um, we have to uh, 
finish the job of this impeachment. But it, and, and then it'll be even more interesting to see if, uh, if more Republicans come out against uh, – actually, the other way, if more Republicans come out for uh, conviction in the Senate, which could, uh, at the end of the day, lead to uh, Donald Trump being barred from running for office again. So is that really what this is about right now? It very well might be. Uh, and, and I think, you know, in some, in some sense, frankly, that might be uh, a blessing in disguise for Republicans. I really wonder what is going to be the future of the Republican Party, because even within the party, we are seeing breaks. Can they come together to be stronger coming out of uh, the Trump administration? Right. I, I think that the Republican Party faces a, a fork in the road. And do they continue with, uh, do, do they continue to forge ahead with the, the, the Trump way, right, which, which did take the party in a different direction from uh, early in the 2000s, for sure. Think about the time of the, maybe the George W. Bush presidency. Uh, very, very different. Um, in many ways or do the republicans uh take a different path and and return to uh, you know what i'll call more quote-unquote normal republican times or or more republican orthodoxy uh on some issues and and in in terms of maybe the way that they campaign and the the rhetoric that's used Uh, i think it'll be we won't know that for a while and i think that there's going to be a lot of internal uh, fighting among the Republicans, you know, but let's let's be honest about it. Anytime there's an election, and and somebody loses, uh, it would be wise for that party uh, to do some self reflection and to to look at what happened and why and and what they need to do to change. And I'd also say too that you are you are completely correct that Republicans are fractured, uh, but but let's not pretend that the Democrats are united. Right. I mean, there are there are serious divisions within uh, the Democratic Party, uh, mainly from uh, the progressive left and the more uh, sort of uh, mainstream or um, and that's probably not a fair term, but uh, the uh, the. Um, oh, I just blanked on the word. <sighs> that's OK. It happens to all of us. The, the establishment wing of the party. Right. And and, and, and that division is going to be front and center as Democrats try to govern in late January, early February, maybe through the first hundred days of the Biden administration, there are going to be uh, some, th- those divisions within the Democratic Party are going to be on display as they try to uh, work through the Biden legislative agenda and, uh, and, and, and get into details of how major issues are going to be tackled in this country. So, you know, I think we, we need to take stock of everybody at this point. I think the next uh, few months are going to be very interesting because for the past, uh, you know, four years, we've heard the Democrats blame so many issues on the Republicans and President Trump. And now that they don't have him to point the finger to, how is it going to change if they can't fix some of these issues within our country? Well, I think uh, whether he's president or not, whether he can run for office again or not, uh, Democrats will continue to point the finger at Donald Trump. Um, now, how, how long that remains effective, I think, uh, remains to be seen. But, uh, but you bring up a good point. Uh, it's, it's for a year or so, uh, it's, it's been uh, Donald Trump's fault on the, the pandemic. Well, now that, um, you know, the, the Democrats are in charge of everything, They've got to fix it, right? If, if they've got ideas, then, then they need to, to take control and, and, and change things. I think you, you see some of the rhetoric, um, maybe from the campaign, that uh, is starting already to be walked back uh, in terms of how many people might be vaccinated in the first 100 days, right? That's proving more difficult. Is, is that anybody's fault? I, I, you know, I'm no expert, right? I'm certainly no uh, public health official or ex or, or knowledgeable on that. But I, I just think that when you're talking about the, the number of vaccinations that need to be done in a country as big as this one, um, it's hard, right? And, and there are, there are, there are difficulties that pop up. 
So we might just be, everybody might just be finding out how difficult it's going to be to get through this. And with that, I also wonder, because of the division within both parties, is this the time that we're going to see a third party start to merge? Uh, I caught the 60 Minutes interview this past Sunday with Angus King, who is an independent, and he had some good arguments on both sides of the coin. So is this a time that maybe some of the independents or a third party grows out of uh, this crisis and where we are right now as a nation? Well, I guess I would look at it this way. Um, you know, the, the, we have this effective two-party system. Um, not that it's effective. It, in effect, we have a two-party system. Uh, and I say that because there are other parties out there, Green Party, Libertarian Party, National Taxpayers Party, right? There's the Socialists. There, there, there's a bunch of them. But uh, Republicans and Democrats are the only ones that generally win national uh, elections at the federal level. And that's because of uh, any number of reasons. So we'll put those aside for, for the minute. But uh, if, if, if the, the U.S. is right now a 50-50 country, right? I mean, it, for, for all intents and purposes, we're, we're pretty evenly divided. Uh, Joe Biden uh, wins the, the presidency and the popular vote by, uh, by a handful of points, right? That doesn't uh, take away from the fact that a, a large number of people voted for Donald Trump. 74 million people voted for Donald Trump. Um, so we're, we're pretty much split. Now, if, if the Republicans splinter um, and, and one segment of the party says, we're out of here, uh, we're going to start our own party. Well, what they've done is, is hand uh, the, the presidency and, and federal elections to the Democrats for the foreseeable future. Uh, and I, I think that, that there are uh, – folks in the GOP that, that know that and realize that, and, and they'll try to prevent that from happening, simply to try to protect uh, the, some of the power that they, that they do have in the states and in, in local elections, etc. So, I, you know, I, I am very skeptical that a third party um, will, will form and be successful. So we all watched <clears throat> as a nation in disbelief when these events were unfolding a week ago in D.C., What's the long-term impact for the state of Michigan? Oh, gosh. Um, for the state of Michigan. Well, I, you know, so you many st- times these issues play out in D.C., but they do trickle down into our own backyards. They do. And, and, and I think you're seeing uh, some reports um, in the last few days that the uh, law enforcement, federal law enforcement is concerned that uh, we might see some other uh, protests in state capitals, so it, it could happen. Um, I'm not saying that not, not a riot, but you could see protests in, in Lansing. You could see uh, gatherings of, of, uh, of, of Trump supporters in Lansing and in other places. Uh, so I, I think we just have to be um, uh, on the lookout for stuff. So one of the things yesterday, if we can go back to the hearings yesterday that some of the Republicans actually brought up, there were very few that actually stood in defense of the president and his actions. However, they did bring up the argument that so many Democrats sat on the sidelines this past summer while the country was in the middle of so many different riots and businesses were being burned and being looted and they sat back and did nothing. Was that a valid argue, argument for them to have in the middle of an impeachment hearing? I, I you know, I, I like to examine events um, on their own merits. And I think that uh, what happened at the Capitol was uh, despicable and shameful. Uh, and I think that it's, but, but I think it's natural for some to, to look back to the summer and, and see parallels, right? Where, um, police stations, uh, other government buildings were, uh, were also attacked. Right. And, and I think that, I I think that again, if, if we're being honest about it, we have to, if we're going to repudiate uh, what happened in Washington as uh, you know political violence and, and how awful it was, 
I think we, we should repudiate all political violence. I will say I am completely surprised at how many people in the Capitol did not seem to care about the repercussions of their actions. They were taking selfies, <clears throat> excuse me, selfies and pictures and live streaming. And the entire time I was thinking, you know, they're coming after you. You can yeah, sit in the seat of Nancy Pelosi's desk and take a picture and not expect that you're going to be charged with some type of crime coming out of that. I, I couldn't agree more. I think that it was, I, I don't know if it was, uh, if they were just caught up in the moment or they don't care or they didn't know, uh, you know, but, but you're right. I mean, they were, you're going to get caught <laughs> these days, right? <laughs> if, you, if, if you, if your face is on uh, Facebook or Twitter or any kind of social media, uh, let alone in the, in the press, right? I mean, with the, where those pictures were, were, circulated um law enforcement's going to find you and 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 these folks are getting charged as they should uh if 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 they broke the law uh you get charged yeah i was involved in the riots in cleveland this past summer and i think within 15 minutes uh friends of my law enforcement community had the guy id'd and so uh, nothing ever happened to him (laughs) um but and that's a sad thing about about all of this is, you know, sometimes the same effort and attention is not made to uh, some of the other incidents. And I think that's kind of what gets people going in these situations. But it was just unbelievable to watch what happened last week in the nation's capital. And I will say, I'm still so astounded that law enforcement wasn't more prepared because the threat was out there. Well, and, and I think you're going to see, uh, uh, and, and maybe this is a, a, you know, we'll see another rare instance of bipartisan cooperation, but I think you're going to see an investigation, uh, a very thorough investigation of what happened uh, and, and why law enforcement wasn't prepared. You know, there, there's um, a few things start to leak out, <clears throat> whether or not uh, the National Guard was uh, uh, was going to be permitted to come. And, and there's some questions about the uh, sergeants at arms in the House and the Senate and whether or not they put a kibosh on the, on the uh, National Guard coming prior to uh, the, the demonstrations that turned into the riot. And it, I think all of it's going to come out. And I think we're going to get a good explanation. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's too little too late. Right. Dave Dulio with us here on the Megacast. He's the professor of political science and the director of the Center for Civic Engagement over at Oakland University. We always appreciate and uh, enjoy your perspective on so many things that are going on right now. And I would like to to have thought that 2021 was going to be a little bit slower for you, but it doesn't look so. (laughs) Uh, Your predictions for Inauguration Day. Oh gosh, uh, no predictions, but but uh, I'll say a hope. Uh, I hope that it goes smoothly. I I, I think that um, you know that we have seen uh, a peaceful transition of power in the United States since the country began, and now there might be some that argue that that's already tarnished, and that might be the case. Um, but I sure hope that it it it. I sure hope we don't see a repeat. I, I think that. Um, you know, it's tough to lose an election. It's tough to uh, see your candidate not come out on top. It's tough to see the other side um, celebrate and and uh, start to govern. But, you know, we've had elections for over 200 years, and everybody's always gotten over it. I think it's time to it, – folks need to, to take a step back. Um, think about rhetoric that's being used, and, and this is on both sides. Um, think about rhetoric that's being used against Republicans, not necessarily those that were involved in the in the riot or the or anything like that, but against Republicans who are uh, you know just everyday folks walking down the street. They're being tarnished by this as well. And is that fair? I think that's a, I think that's a good question. So rhetoric on both sides needs to be ratcheted way down and allow us to move forward 
uh, and and try to address those big issues that you mentioned uh, just a bit ago, the, certainly related to the pandemic uh, and other big issues that are out there. Right. The, the, the fact that all this is happening doesn't mean that there aren't major issues and, and huge things that we've got to figure out how to how to address in the United States. And let's hope that it also starts to open up the lines of communication and we can see some cooperation and compromise between the two parties going forward as well. Wouldn't that be nice? Oh my gosh, we all deserve it. In 2021, American uh, people deserve it after everything we've been through, right? Absolutely. Dave Dulio, uh, thank you so much for your time. We always appreciate it. And I'm sure we'll be speaking with you again rather soon. And I hope you get your internet up and running. <laughs> Thanks very much. We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. And when we come back, we'll be speaking with the Marketing and Communications Director for Forgotten Harvest. This is the Oakland County Megacast. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson, and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our police and fire departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet, wear facial coverings when you leave your home, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. As rivals, we don't always see eye to eye. Like who scored the best recruits? Who's gonna be who? And whether we wear green or blue. But one thing we can all agree on to help stop the spread of COVID-19. Wear a mask. 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 The ball's in your court, Michigan. Thank you for hanging with us on the Thursday edition of the Oakland County Mega Cast. You know, for so many people, food insecurity has been a big issue here in the United States and across the country and the world as well prior to the pandemic. However, the COVID-19 crisis has also brought it to the front lines. It's estimated that nearly 50 million people here in the United States does they face food insecurity, 17 million of those kids. And the person that knows that all too well, Christopher Ivey, he's the Marketing and Communications Director for Forgotten Harvest. He joins us now on the Megacast. You have a tough job. Yeah, yeah. Good morning, Ronnie. How are you? Thank you um, for yeah, being with us. Um, that those, those national numbers are really staggering. I mean, locally here in Metro Detroit, because of before the pandemic, there was about 584,000 people that we deem as food insecure. And after the pandemic and through sort of all of the things up until now, we're looking at more like 700,000 people. So that number is just, it, 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 it's staggering when you think about it. But you're also dealing with this at a time in our country where a lot of donations are, are down as well because corporations aren't giving like they once did. Yeah, well, it's it's really a challenge. Um, and I will say that, you know, through the holiday season is typically our is the largest giving season. Um, but I, what I can say is that our community has really, really stepped up and helped Forgotten Harvest through this. Um, we've actually had some really large corporate donations come in. Some fantastic partners have really stepped up. Um, we've had, you know, Forgotten Harvest has been here for 30 years and we've had some really good longstanding relationships. And when these kind of things happen, um, they know those corporate partners and individuals actually know what Forgotten Harvest can do and know the power that we can do and, and the ability to get, you know, our 45 plus million pounds of food out into the community. And they know that really, you know, between volunteerism and, you know, um, financial support, those are the two biggest things we need in order to do that and do that mission every day. Um, you know, this community has helped us and supported us financially to help us get it done. So it's actually been really staggering to see the outpouring of support that we've received. What's it been like for you on the volunteer front? Are people more comfortable coming out and helping you during this time? Well, um, 
you know, I can say that people still want to help. And in order to give them that opportunity, we've actually, through the pandemic, um, us in order to us, help us actually stockpile extra food, um, our warehouse in Oak Park is our primary warehouse, and it's only about 30,000 square feet. And we filled that, you know, most of that is refrigeration. Some of it is dry goods storage. Um, in order to deal with the pandemic and actually help and have volunteers come in and help, we leased additional space in Royal Oak um, so that we can actually have our volunteers creating food boxes and sort of sorting through and gleaning product. And we can do that in a safe, socially distanced way. We've got all the protocols in place with masks and gloves and, and aprons if they want them and even face shields. So um, I will say that uh, volunteerism was really, really difficult, March, April, May, June. And as people became more comfortable in understanding that some of the safety protocols that we have in place, um, that we've been very taught, we've been very vocal about sharing those. And, um, and people understand that those things will help sort of uh, mitigate the trans, uh, transmission of the virus. So we put all those protocols in place and we've seen our volunteer numbers have come back up through the holidays, but we do anticipate January and February are typically really slow for us um, with volunteers. And the biggest thing is, is our corporate volunteers. We've got large corporate partners, um, you know, quick in all the big three automotive companies. Part of their corporate ethos is giving back to the community. And those employees are really not able to do that because they have to maintain their own safety so they can continue working. So we have seen a downtick in that, but we have our individual volunteers have stepped up again and helped the organization. Um, you know, just for some numbers standpoint, you know, Forgotten Harvest in a typical year, we have almost 17, 16, 5, 17,000 volunteers a year. And this year will be a little bit lower, but um, because of our extra space that we have and we actually have um, our mobile pantry system that we uh, distribution system that we have volunteers at that as well we're able to get more opportunities so instead of everybody coming to our one warehouse and our farm in fenton we've got multiple locations so we're kind of spreading those fifteen thousand volunteers over multiple locations so um the need is greater and the need is always there for volunteers and it's a really easy great way for someone to give back because ultimately, I think people do want to help their neighbors and help in the community, and that gives them the opportunity to do that. And so, talk a little. <clears throat> excuse me. Talk a little bit more about the mobile food pantry. How is that working? Uh, it actually is working really, really well. So, um, and again, I'll go back to sort of the beginning of the pandemic and kind of when the lights went off in March. Um, a lot of our distribution network is is other agency partners. We have over 250 agency partners out there. And those agencies are primarily run by volunteers as well. So when all of this sort of happened, businesses closed down, pantries started shutting down, we had to continue to get the food out there. So we, we had a test pilot program called our Forgotten Harvest on the go mobile pantry system. And we really ramped that up. We opened like in short order, I would say within a couple of weeks, we had 17 mobile sites up and running. Um, and these were, primarily run by Forgotten Harvest staff members in the beginning. Um, now they're run by like sort of super volunteers and uh, other volunteers right now, or we find a community partner to, to take them over ongoing. But then this mobile pantry system is, is a way for us to continue to get the food into the community, into areas of need where there may not be a, 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 an agency partner or a brick and mortar pantry for us to be able to distribute to. So it's been really super successful. How does it work for individuals that maybe don't have transportation though? Well, that is part of the challenge because the way the mobile pantry system works um, is, is that the cars will line up and they'll sort of open their trunk up and we'll have volunteers or staff um, put things directly in their trunk so we can limit the number of touch points. So one of the, that, what you were referring to in a bigger picture is like sort of the access problem, right? Um, and that's one of the things that the super sites let us do. And it's part of also what our ongoing strategic plan, where we're trying to figure out access, supply, knowledge, and heightened community awareness. And those are sort of the four go forward points of Forgotten Harvest as we're looking forward to, you know, the rest of this year and the next 30 years. Um, those are the things that we're really going to work on. And access is really about, um, optimizing our local emergency food distribution network, um, 
and using the food insecurity index to kind of pick areas of need um, in an alt and pick areas of need where there's not currently a distribution site and then kind of set up the ability for people to get the food they need. Forgotten Harvest doesn't have the bandwidth to deliver door to door. It's just not something we can do. It's not our, it's not our strong point. It's probably not something we would ever do, but the goal is to have enough agency partners and um, you know, whether it's a church organization or a, a food shelter, a food pantry or whatever it would be to have enough of those pantry partners where someone would not have to drive across town. You know, we kind of look at everything in a, in a, a grid it's like a two mile grid and we're trying to get pantries spaced out strategically in areas of need that if someone had to walk, they could. Um, and we also have a, 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 the ability for someone to be, uh, I'm using, not using the right word, but a surrogate for someone else so that they can pick up for their neighbor. So, you know, uh, let's say there's someone in a senior center and they're picking up for four of their friends we have that ability for to for someone to be able to do that and then they can take it back and distribute it like you know to their friends and neighbors that that don't have transportation oh what do you think is going to be a positive shift for your organization coming out of this crisis oh wow that's a tough one um i i think what it is um as i mentioned like some of the things Every area will have um, a, positive, uh, a positive impact or this will change every area of the organization. Um, like I said, we've got the access, supply, knowledge and awareness. Um, the pandemic has really sort of refocused the community awareness and our, it's opened the door for us to have conversations with some of our partners that they may have not been ready to have. Um, it's also given us the ability to sort of pull forward and to prove some of the things that we thought were um, probably a direction the organization was gonna go, um, like the mobile pantry distribution sites for one. That was a test pilot we had that we knew worked, but we didn't know that it would work at scale. We've proved that it worked at scale and it works really well. So those kind of like, um, our CEO Kirk Mays is really great in, in his thought leadership in, in his ability to sort of project forward what the community needs are and um and we have an ongoing we have a rolling strategic plan that focuses on the four pillars we talked about and then we also we look at everything um through a lens and we call it the four r's and it's the right food at the right place and the right quantity at the right time and that is really our vision our go forward vision for forgotten harvest for the next 30 years um providing that right food in the right place so we're finding the right partners the right food mix um, a more balanced um, mix of food where there's a protein and a vegetable and the, the, the health benefits of um, fresh green beans versus canned green beans. That's a big focus of the organization, right? Um, providing that fresh, nutritious food, making sure that it's in the right quantity, making sure that people are getting enough, but they're not getting so much that it's going to go to waste. Um, and at the right time, when do they need it? Um, for example, we've got one of our mobile pantry pipes sites that we've set up. We've got a site in Sterling Heights that we started last week. We've actually moved location because there was such an increased need. So, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> we went from the Civic Center um, and we're now we're going to Joseph Dahlia Park. And that pantry is scheduled in the evening from 4.30 to 7.30. Um, and that's because in that area, we know that there's a lot of people that are still you know, working or maybe working a little bit less, but they still need the help to get through. Um, Forgotten Harvest is, is, is something different to everybody. Some people we are, you know, the end of the month, they need a little bit of extra help to get through when other people, maybe we're all the help they get. And that's, and, and so we try to be what we can for everyone. We can't be everything for everyone, but we try to do what we can do, you know, with our limitations. Well, you mean so much to so many people. You're listening to 89.3 WBLD Orchard Lake, 88.1 WBFH Bloomfield Hills. We're speaking with Christopher Ivy. He's the marketing and communications director for Forgotten Harvest. Uh, you are so important to our community. We only have another uh, few seconds here with you because we need to get to Representative Brenda Lawrence. But uh, Chris, before we let you go, if people want to volunteer or donate, how can they do so? Yeah, they just go right to our website, forgottenharvest.org, O-R-G, 
um, and, and if whether they want to donate their time, which would be volunteering, donate their resources, which would be financial support, or um, just share the knowledge with someone that's out there. I mean, everybody knows somebody that's in need or has been impacted by this pandemic. You know, just give the information to somebody that, that helps someone get the, what help they need. And, and don't be embarrassed to ask either. That's the other thing too. Um, you know, we're here, we've been here for 30 years and uh, we're, we're, we're happy to help and you just have to ask for it. The logistics involved in what you and your team do really is amazing. Uh, it's like you said, being able to get the right food to the right people at the right time mm -hmm. so the food doesn't go to waste as well. Thank you so much. Uh, and please extend our gratitude to your team members as well for their dedication, their commitment to the public during this crisis. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, thank you for the platform to be able to talk about what we do. It's really important to get our, the word out there so that people know we're here to help. So again, if you want to volunteer Forgotten Harvest, go ahead and check out their website and sign up to be a part of the solution during this crisis. You're listening to the Oakland County Megacast. Michigan, we still need to stay careful because we don't want to go backwards, back to where we started. So keep standing six feet apart, keep wearing a mask in public, and if you have symptoms, talk to a healthcare provider about getting tested. To move forward, let's all do our part. So stay careful. Michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Hi, I'm Dr. Faust, the medical director for the Oakland County Health Division. The most important thing you can do to prevent the spread of illness is to wash your hands thoroughly and often. Follow these six easy steps every time you wash your hands. Step one, turn on the sink and wet your hands with warm water. Step two, apply soap to your hands and lather between your fingers, under your nails, and the front and back of your hands and wrists. Step three, wash your hands by scrubbing them together for at least 20 seconds. Step four, rinse your hands with warm, clean water. And step five, dry your hands with a clean cloth towel, a paper towel, or hot air blow dryer. If you're using a cloth towel, make sure to change it often. For handheld faucets, turn off the water using a paper towel instead of your bare hand. Step six, if you're using a paper towel, throw it away. Practice healthy habits like washing your hands after coughing or sneezing into them to keep you and others healthy. Go to oakgov.com slash health or call Nurse on Call at 1-800-848-5533 to learn more. Sadly, it's been a historic time for our nation's capital 2021 and how everything has started in the new year. It's sad. It's been... Uh, a few weeks. Uh, we are only how many days into the new year and we've all sat in disbelief as we watch the events unfold at the nation's capital on January 6. And while we watched from the comfort of our homes or from our offices, Representative Brendan Lawrence with the U.S. House 14th Congressional District, she was there. I watched your Twitter feed. She joins us now on the Megacast. How are you doing today? I'm, I'm, I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. It's been a roller coaster of emotions of between um, fear to anger to disbelief to searching to find my hope. So it's it's I'm okay. Before we get to the events yesterday with the vote, where were you exactly when the rioters were breaking in to the Capitol? I was on the floor doing my job, my constitutional responsibility to vote and to certify the Electoral College. As you know, Michigan was one of the states that were being contested. So I was on the floor waiting for my time to speak. Um, police ran in, they took Nancy out, they locked the doors and told us to, to secure a shelter to protect ourselves. They told us to put on gas masks. They told us they were headed. It was, I can't remember, I cannot forget the sound of them saying they're headed our way. And then they said, um, then we heard this banging and beating on the door. And you hear this large, 
sound of people yelling and shouting and just all these people banging on the door and then the police coming in with guns drawn saying, come on, go this way, go this way, run, run, run. And taking us down hallways and back staircases till they um, got us to a room where they could secure us. So that day I was, it was, you know, unbelievable. But when I got home and able to see the footage from what was happening and that there were guns, there were bombs, there were zip ties. And, you know, just the thought, what were they going to do to us? If they had gotten in that room and gotten to the members who were Democrats and Republican, you have to, I want everyone to know it wasn't just Democrats running, it was Republicans as well. What were they going to do to us? And then they're shouting, hang Mike Pence. He was in the Capitol. What were they going to do if they had found Mike Pence, who had been taken to a secure place as well? So uh, following the events, uh, once the uh, building was secure, you mm -hmm. guys went back to work. Yes. What was that decision making process like and why did you do it? Because you just went through an emotional trauma. trauma. All of you did. So it was, <laughs> that's another moment I won't forget. So we were in there, I don't know how many hours. And so Nancy walks in and she goes to the mic and she says, today we were attacked and we are at war and we are here to protect our democracy. We will not allow anyone to stop us. We're gonna to return to the floor and do our job. Because if we don't, they win. And I'm sitting there like you saying, oh my God, I just went through a trauma. I'm trying to get myself together. But it was the right call. Um, we did continue to do our work and understand we are, um, we take a pledge to protect the people of this country and our democracy and our constitution. And so we had to go back to work. And um, it's been so many levels. When we finally got to the floor to see all the damage, the broken glass, the tear gas cans, the damage to the walls and to wood and just hearing them banging on the door keep resounding. And now I just went back, as you know, and uh, to take a vote on impeachment and to walk through the Capitol. And I said, to see the, the wounds of war all over that building uh, is still a trauma that I have to deal with. So I know um, my sister used to be a flight attendant and she was on a flight one time that had to do an emergency landing. And one of the things that they immediately did was try to get them back working to get them on another flight because it's part of the healing process because there are yeah. some people that won't go back to mm -hmm. work. That fear will be ingrained in them. So do you think by all of you going immediately back to work to take up that vote to continue that vote, not only sent a message, but was also the first step in the healing process for you as individuals? I agree um, wholeheartedly because the fear and looking over my shoulder, listening to make sure that I'm not hearing any signs of, and I'm like, I asked, I don't know how many times to the Capitol Police, are you sure the building is secure? Are you sure? Because if anyone's ever been to the Capitol, there's so many nooks and crannies and places people could hide out. And they said, yes, Congresswoman, we're sure. We've checked every place. So, um, but I want you to know when I went back, I had so much anxiety of flying back to DC. There are so many National Guards. You can't walk five feet without running into another National Guard. Um, there's a lot of discussion about the inauguration now. Are we gonna go back for the inauguration? I have been to the last six. I mean, I can't imagine not being there 
history is going to be made, a Black woman is going to be sworn in as the Vice President of the United States. But my family is very concerned about the safety of the inauguration. It's sad. It's sad. It is really sad that this is the state and where our country is right now. And, and with that, do you think that they should maybe do a private inauguration? And it, it, because we are still in the middle of a pandemic and a crisis as well. So, I mean, Joe Biden, who will be the next president of the United States, has been criticized for being so cautious. As you know, he did rallies, but you had to be in a car. He I remember he came to town for um, during a campaign. And normally when you take a picture with someone, you stand next to him. And no, you had to stand six feet away from him. Um, so it's going to be very limited, uh, Ronnie. It's, got, it's not going to be the massive crowds that we've seen before. I normally, as a member of Congress, get over 100 tickets to invite constituents. I get one ticket and they will be socially distanced. There, there is a certain part of healing too, that this is real. If we were in a back room doing the inauguration, then it can say it never really happened because he's, he's not a legitimate president. So to have a public event that can be viewed by America, the peaceful transition of power, I feel is important and part of our healing as a country. Representative Brenda Lawrence with us here on the mega cast. Uh, if we can bring you up to date with the events that happened yesterday, you said we cannot begin healing and unity without accountability and justice. Talk about the moment of standing in front of the podium and making your voice heard for all of the people of the state of Michigan and for the members uh, that you represent in the 14th congressional district. Mm -hmm. I listened with great intent to the debate, uh, the conversation going back and forth of why people oppose the impeachment because it's such a short period of time. And I told a few of my uh, colleagues, I said, if you have a student, a child, and this child is an all A student, and that child takes a gun or a knife to school and attack someone, you can't say, well, he's an all A student. So therefore you shouldn't even address this behavior. And it sounds like there's a lot of deflecting, like what about the Black Lives Matter? If someone else beats their wife, that doesn't make you okay beating your wife. Every crime should be, there should be accountability. And you know that, that overall desire of so many of us to bring this country back together, to start healing it, and to say that impeachment is going to be a reason why this country can't heal, where I feel strongly, and that's why I went to the mic, if we really want to unify this country, then accountability and justice must be consistent. It must be, if you allow some people to commit crimes and we saw what happened um, and you just turn your head, that is not a way to unify this country. Think of the, the thousands and thousands of people who are in prison for committing crime because our laws and our um, system of justice. And in this case, there may be additional charges because Everyone talks about the riot. It was a deadly riot. Five people died, five. A police officer was murdered. And we cannot walk away from that. But to play devil's advocate here in this conversation, why didn't the Democrats stand up more this past summer when we saw so much looting and burning and rioting at our businesses across the country, but also some of our state and government buildings as well. Well, I can't speak for other members. I'm on the record saying that rioting is not protesting. Destroying property is not protesting. That's a riot and it's wrong. And I continue to say, 
Those who did that should be held accountable and arrested for the property damage. But I want everyone to know you cannot equate protests for civil rights to a riot because I didn't win an election in a riot that went to stop democracy from happening. A riot that was went into the Capitol to disrupt the constitutional requirement of Congress. And we, we would cannot, like to, cannot equate them. Yeah, and we would like to point out there were a lot of peaceful protesters that were there earlier yes, in the they day. Were. Uh, just like we've seen throughout the country all summer as well. And what's sad is messages get lost in these moments of violence as well. Uh, and with that, um, is the impeachment process also about ensuring that Trump does not hold office again? I feel strongly that come January 21, Donald Trump will begin campaigning again and building onto the army he's already assembled of those who feel that we are the enemy, we being Democrats or anyone that, you know, now Republicans, if you, anyone that does not agree with Donald Trump, they are the enemy, including the vice president. And the fear I have of that in this country is extreme. And in my view, Donald Trump has, has not grasped. His words mean something. I, one of his opponents said, he just didn't get that when he says something, people would do it. How can you not? And you're the president of the United States. And after four years, you haven't grasped that? You should not be the president of the United States. And in addition to that, the people have spoken. It's, they did not want Donald Trump to continue. And then when you look at the defiance of the role, the, the decorum and the responsibilities and the need for compassion from the president of the United States has been grossly missing. And it, I have lived through Republican presidents. And for me, this is not partisan. <clears throat> I've lived through a, a Bush presidency. I, two of them. I know that there's different philosophies, but neither of those presidents were as divisive. You know, the, one of the first things out of Biden's mouth is that I am going to be the president of the United States, whether you voted for me or not, I'm your president and I have the responsibility. I have continuously been called the radical left. Those people, those Democrats, they are our enemy. They're not with us. And it's like, we as Democrats moving forward, Ronnie, and I want to say this, I have a responsibility to make sure that every voice is heard. The people who were peacefully protesting, I need to hear them. I need to make sure, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, if you feel that our government is not meeting your needs, it's on me to hear you and to take care of you. And I'm committed to that. And those who are peaceful and wanna talk and debate with me, I'm, I'm, your, I'm your congresswoman. But for those who are rioting and I'm the enemy and they wanna, uh, you know, they said, we wanna take over the government. We have a democracy. We have a democracy here and we have checks and balances. And the way to be heard is not to come in kill people, riot, and destroy property. I always say, for those individuals, if you want to be a part of the solution, run for office. I agree. Get a seat and be a part of the conversation. With that, too, you mentioned the divisiveness that's gone on in our country. We did see some Republicans break with the Republican Party and vote to impeach the president yesterday. Is this the beginning of some type of compromise in our nation's capital amongst our elected leaders? Because it seems like the two sides have not been able to get a lot of things done because of the divisiveness. Is this the beginning of the two sides coming together and working together? Right, and one of the things that has happened very quietly because there's been so many other things happening 
the Senate is going to be one vote in the majority. And the House, the, the narrow of majority is so slim that we don't have a choice but to work together. We are not, you know, there's a thing called the super majority. That means it doesn't matter what the other side do. You can ram through any bill you want. We have that in our state government. The Republicans are super majority and they just ram through votes. We are in a position where we must work together. And that I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with walking across the aisle and say, can you support this bill? If not, what do we need to do so that you can support it? Do you agree? Um, and that's something that um, I did before, but I didn't have to. Now I'm going to have to. Nancy and um, McCarthy are going to have to be joined to the hip and McConnell and um, uh, uh, geez, the, the, the majority leader in the Senate, they're now going to have to work together. So it's a good thing. And you know, we won't have from the top daily messages and tweets telling people to hate each other. It's going to be one of, I'm so excited about Biden taking that seat, having compassion and working and asking people to work together. There are so many uh, other things and topics I want to talk to you about, but we're running out of time. One of those just being about the social media and the president losing his platform, but we'll have to get to that another day. Uh, but we do want to say thank you for taking time out. We know it's been an insanely busy week. Mm -hmm. And also, as you said, a roller coaster week as well for you and members of our elected leaders. Uh, as we are continuing to watch history unfold here, we were hoping 2021 was going to be a little bit quieter, <laughs> but it doesn't seem to be that way. Uh, please be safe, though. Uh, I know that, uh, you know, you'll be there at the inauguration, and I'm sure that there are concerns, but mm -hmm. we wish you the best and want to say thank you again for being with us today. Thank you so much. And freedom of speech is very important. But we all know that if we all our freedom of speech, we can't holler fire in the middle of a public place and create mayhem and fear. And we saw what happened uh, organizing that event through social media. And I feel that um, we have some real hard looks at our freedom of speech in this country. Well, let's hope to going forward, the inauguration is in a quiet event and a safe event yes. um, because there are a lot of safety concerns, but we hope to have you on again after the inauguration. Happy Brenda New Morris. Year, be safe, and I'm counting on a better year this year. We all are. So many other things we want to talk to you, but we'll have to hold that conversation. Thank you again, though, Representative Brenda Lawrence. Thank she you. represents the 4th Congressional District. We're going to take a quick break here on the Mega Castell. A lot to get to in the remainder of the show. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test. And now it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so, those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. Our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, We've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward, not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. The only way to beat COVID-19 is to face it. You can't get too comfortable. You can't forget the danger. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wash your hands. Keep a safe distance. Especially in the next few months. You know we'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. Someday. But not yet. Not yet. Not yet. But not yet. But not yet. Consider virtual gatherings for the holidays. Curbside food order. Grocery delivery. And shopping local shop local and especially shopping local. 
Let's beat this virus. We can if we face it together. 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 For the latest information, visit oakgov.com forward slash COVID. Perry tested positive for COVID-19. Emma was exposed to a friend who's positive. Willa's waiting on test results. After any contact with COVID-19, or if you test positive, stay home for at least 10 days. If you live with others, keep your distance and wear a mask. Help Michigan contain COVID-19. Visit michigan.gov slash contain COVID. Welcome back to the Thursday edition of the Oakland County Megacast. We want to extend our apologies to our next uh, two guests. We are running a little bit late, but we felt that the interview with our representative, Brenda Lawrence, was an important conversation for us to have, especially considering the events that have unfolded over the past week at the nation's capital. And just as a reminder, you can catch us on Civic Center TV, also Birmingham Area Municipal Access, if you do have cable, tune us in, channel 15 on Comcast 99, if you have AT&T. If you're out driving around, you can listen to us on the radio, 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 FM, the BIP. And we also want to say thank you to Oakland University for allowing us to live stream today's edition of the Megacast on their Facebook page. And with that, we are excited to bring in our next guest, Dr. Brandy Randall. She's the Dean of the Oakland University Graduate School. Great to have you with us here on the Megacast. I have to ask, you're new to the university. What has it been like for you to start a new job in the middle of a pandemic? You know, it's been really surreal. And first, I want to thank you for having me on today. Um, I, I started August 1st, and I started remotely. And so I was still living in North Dakota when I started my position and was not able to move here until the middle of September. And so I'm working with a lot of people um, who most of whom I've not met in person. It's so weird, though, right? Because you, you and there is something for Zoom and Google Meets and all of these other platforms, but nothing really kind of replaces those organic conversations that happen in person. Yes, that is very true. But, um, you know, I've, I've got a wonderful staff in the graduate school and we spend a lot of time together on Zoom. And so I feel like we're getting to know each other, even though we haven't been able to meet in person for the most part. Uh, but it's also like a great real life experience for you to be able to share and relate to some of the students and what they're going through right now. Because I do know like my niece is about to graduate um, from the University of Michigan and she you know, was going to go to med school but now has decided to change her major and take a gap year. Do you recommend students take a gap year during this crisis? You know, I think that really depends on the student and um, what they need in terms of support. I have been teaching for a really long time and a lot of that time I've been teaching in online programs. And so I know from my own experience that, you know, there's there are ways to do really high quality remote education using our using technology um, and that students can still build really tight connections with each other, um, support each other, and and have an excellent experience uh, e even remotely. But what is it like for students right now in the job market? Is this a good time for them to jump into the job market? Because they'll be like you if they do, and that a lot of their jobs would be remote, which could hinder maybe their progress in that. So is it a good year to say, hey, let me just go ahead and go to grad school? Yeah, I actually, I think you're right that it is an excellent time to go to graduate school. You know, the, the job market's tight. We're in an economic downturn. And we know from our, our nation's history that once we're past that, that time of economic downturn, that the people who took the time during the downturn to pursue their education really come out farther ahead when the economy gets back to normal and things are looking good again. So taking that time to build your skills and your knowledge 
helps give you something that sets you apart from other people when things recover. Dr. Brandy Randall with us here on the MegaCast. She is the new dean for the Oakland University Graduate School. And with that, we're thinking kind of like the traditional school or student that just is graduating to just go jump into a grad school. But what about people that have graduated maybe even five, 10 years ago? Uh, maybe their job, they were laid off, they're underemployed right now. Is this a good time for them to consider trying to, you know, address that gap maybe in the resume and make themselves more attractive to some of these employers by going ahead and getting uh, that advanced degree. Absolutely. It is an excellent time. And, you know, for people who might want to change careers or pursue a different, different direction um, or to have a higher level position than they have had up till now, this opportunity to um, you know, build that skills, build their knowledge. Uh, we, we can't go to um, movies, we can't go to live music. And so I think many of us are finding that we do have some extra time now that we could be building up that skill set. Um, and you know, we've got a lot of opportunities for people to do that. Uh, one of the things that's really nice about graduate education is that by definition, the population that's engaged in graduate education, they are adult learners. And so people who have been out of school for a while, if they decide to go back and pursue a graduate degree, they'll find that there are a wide range of ages, but that everybody is, you know, an adult. And that really also makes the educational experience a little bit different. But if someone has been out of school for a while, because um, I'm taking an online class right now as well, and now everything is pretty much virtual and everything is, you know, via Zoom and this, that, and the other, I find my mind wandering a little bit more. What advice do you give to people uh, that are considering jumping in to grad school on how to reintegrate themselves into that learning mode? You know, I think one of the things that's really important to do is to talk to your professors about challenges that you might be having, um, because depending on your discipline, there may be different ways to approach the tasks that you have. Um, I always, for me, when I was going through grad school, staying organized and staying on top of things was really essential, making sure that I knew when all the deadlines were and having a plan for achieving those deadlines. One of the things that, um, you know, a, a graduate degree, people who have earned a graduate degree have demonstrated that they have the ability to tackle big projects. And doing that successfully requires breaking things up into smaller segments for what, what you'll accomplish when. And so that same approach can really help with keeping your mind on task when you're in Zoom and focusing on being present, what you're doing right now um, and doing that to the best of your ability. So with that, how competitive is it to get into grad school right now? Well, it's, it's really always competitive because graduate programs are looking for the people who are most likely to be successful, who have the, um, the study habits as well as the, the ways of thinking that will let them flourish in a graduate program. Um, so making sure, you know, most graduate programs are going to require that you develop a, a, some sort of written document, a personal statement about why you want to pursue this degree, um, making sure that you take the time to proofread that, uh, to think really carefully about who your letters of reference will come from, and that they're able to speak to your ability to be successful will help people even in a competitive environment. And so with that, how, uh, one last question before we let you go, how has the application process changed due to the pandemic or hasn't it really? You know, it hasn't changed because graduate, most, most universities have gone to online application systems for at least the last 10 to 15 years. Even letters of reference are done electronically. And so it's really easy to apply. Um, all you have to do is go to, you can go to Oakland's website and find the information really easily. 
about getting started with an application. What are the big markets right now, job markets? Well, obviously healthcare. Um, I think the pandemic has really highlighted the ways in which um, we don't have enough healthcare practitioners of, of any variety of healthcare. Um, engineering is certainly always um, a, a really attractive uh, field. Um, cybersecurity is very important. I think if you look at the, the major challenges that are facing the world today, that really helps you see where your possibilities will be for your own career. Um, the climate change and the green economy and all of the technology that is required to um, develop innovative solutions to our, our climate challenges. Dr. Brandy Randall with us here on the MegaCast. She's the new dean over at the Oakland University Graduate School. Great to have you with us here on the MegaCast. Well, it was great to be here. Thank you. We will also want to say a welcome to the area and congratulations on your new position. Thank you. I am really enjoying it. There's so much, you know, in the way of beautiful parks and um, the birds. It's just really a fabulous place to be. Well, welcome to the community and hopefully the pandemic will be over sometime soon in the future so that you can get out and, and really enjoy the area. Thank you. We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. Just about 20 minutes left in the show. And when we come back, we'll be speaking with the restaurant critic for the Detroit News. This is the Oakland County Megacast. COVID-19 has caused many families to fall behind on finances and on groceries. But you're not alone. You shouldn't have to worry about putting food on the table. MyBridges offers access to quality food and income assistance to help families across the state get the food support they need. It's easy to apply and easy to start shopping. Apply for services at michigan.gov slash MIBridges. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Michigan, we're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19 to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Great to have you with us here on the Megacast. Just uh, about 15 minutes left in the show, and we are going to continue the conversation now that is surrounding so many of our restaurants. They are struggling as uh, they were hoping to be able to reopen this Saturday. That is not going to be happening for in-dining services. And so now they're looking at the possibility of February 1st, but the governor is pretty much saying that number and that date is not etched in stone because they are going to continue to monitor the numbers. Joining us now is going to be Melody Baton. She's the restaurant critic for the Detroit News. Great to have you with us here on the Megacast. Thanks, Ronnie. Good to be here. Are these restaurants going to survive? Um, many of them, I hope, I hope they all do, yes. Um, but like you said, there's you know another two weeks or more of no indoor dining, which means, you know, for many small bars, nothing. Um, and for restaurants, it's either outdoor dining or carry out or a mix of both. Um, you know, they're doing, I'm seeing meal packages, family packs, um, cook at home, kind of groceries to go. They're getting really creative. They pivot, pivot, pivot every time this happens. Um, what's good about February 1st is if they can open, then they'll get those Valentine's Day reservations, which is kind of the big hit and first hit of the year for restaurants. Um, also, the Super Bowl for bars is going to be big. 
um, you know, to watch in sports bars and things like that. So hopefully um, the numbers will go down and the state will think it's safe enough. And February 1st is the date. And by then, I think we're looking at about 160 days of indoor dining ban throughout the last 12 months. That really is astounding. And, you know, until you mentioned those two big days for the restaurant industry, I hadn't thought of those, which makes me think she may even delay it until after the 14th, because that's one of the things, you know, it was those holiday parties and those holiday gatherings that they were trying to avoid uh, during this first ban. I will say one of the things I do like the igloos, um, especially if you're lucky enough to get a reservation on a day that it's snowing. I feel like I'm in a snow globe when I get to go to them. But on the other side of that, I don't get this. What is the science behind this? Because I feel like all you're doing on so many of these venues is you're taking outdoors, you're indoor putting it outdoors, but it's indoors, but you're outdoors, so it's okay. Right. And I think, and Whitmer uh, touched on this in her speech this week, what they want to avoid is people from different households gathering inside and taking their masks off. And in a dining room, though they're spread apart, you still have that. Whereas in one of the domes or the chalets or the greenhouses, all the different things that are coming out now, you've got one household, assumedly, I mean, you can meet up with friends, but you're separated from all the other diners and the server comes in when they come in, they have a mask on, you'll put your mask up, they leave the food and then they leave. So, it, and then with disinfecting in between uses, that's you know supposed to be safer than indoor dining altogether or one of those big tents where all the sides are closed. They really need to keep those sides open so there's airflow um, through if there's more than one table inside the tent. Yeah, I've seen uh, pictures of some of my friends at some of these bigger tents and I'm like, the, the sides don't look open there. And I think a lot of times too, it has to do with the city that you're in and how strict the ordinance is or the enforcement is as well. I, I will say um, the greenhouse, uh, we live here in Kiko Harbor, uh, B1, Bachelor One, they are actually uh, starting to build some of those greenhouses now as well and kind of developing a beer garden outside to you know, entice people to uh, come to the restaurant. I think some of those things may stick around because they are cute um, I, or from a, you know, from a chick standpoint, I like them. I like the atmosphere, but it also goes to the relying on people to say that you're coming from the same household. We know that's not happening. Right. And we're not supposed to gather in households. So I think a lot of people are saying, well, let meet me for coffee, meet me for drinks and, and dinner. And, you know, because they're allowed to, I mean, we're not supposed to, but it, it is allowed. The restaurants are not supposed to say, oh, you guys don't live together. We can't see you together. That That's not on them. Um, so it's up to everyone, you know, individually to make those decisions. But you're right. They're, they're, they're cute. They're fun. They're definitely around to stay because I know restaurants have been putting a lot of money into these. And even if indoor dining, when indoor dining is allowed, when it warms up, when the numbers go down and everyone gets vaccinated, there's still going to be um, people that are concerned and it's increasing their footprint. If they're allowed to do it, they're going to keep the outdoor spaces for sure. And But that is one of the things too, is we have to remember every time they make these additions, it's costing them money at a time when they're not bringing in money. So it can be very challenging for some of these restaurants to be able to do it. And others simply aren't able to either, you know, due to their location or, or some other stumbling blocks that are in the way. Right, and they, you know, they're trying to convey to the public that what you just said, that this is expensive. A lot of places are, are saying, you know, it's cost $50 to make the reservation and then that comes off your bill, but you have to expend that just so it's worth it for them because they may only have one or two domes or one or two shanties. And on a weekend, people wanna get in. It's, it's a very popular activity now because um, there's not much else to do and people have to realize that, yeah, it's going to cost um, a, a monetary commitment up front so that they know they're getting, the restaurant is getting, um, you know, enough to cover being open. Yeah, I was surprised when I made reservations that you had to give your card and it was a $50 fee to reserve the spot. And it was in case you didn't show up as well. Right. And $50, I think, is on the low end. I've seen upwards of $300 for bigger um, bigger structures. Yeah, for sure. What? Yeah, I've seen it. But it comes off the bill. And these, you know, it's if you have a six person table, you figure every person with dinner and drinks, $50 a person, you know, that's the commitment that they need a table to make if they want it and they get booked. 
Uh, so the governor did recently, uh, yesterday, she announced uh, some of the funding to try to help some of these businesses as well as some of the employees. The $45 million uh, program, uh, $45 million is not going to go very far, um, up to $20,000 per uh, restaurant or entity that does apply, $1,650 per individual uh, up to, we should say. And the one thing I find interesting about this as well, it's a 10 day window that you can apply and it's not going to be on first come first serve basis. So was there any discussion about how they're going to try to allocate this money? I, I haven't heard anything specifically about how they'll allocate it. I'm sure it's based on need and, um, and you know numbers of employees, which has been a factor in the past, but I've heard a lot from restaurant owners that this is not enough. It's not coming soon enough. It's not coming off often enough. Um, employees as well, especially for places, like I said, that don't have a carryout business, that it's just not that type of restaurant or, or they don't have a kitchen. They just serve drinks. And that's how they've, you know, existed for decades. You know, thinking of um, old neighborhood bars and longstanding uh, neighborhood watering holes that just don't do, you know, they're not gonna do a carryout six pack of Budweiser if that's what they sell normally because you can get that at the party store, the liquor store. So I think that, you know, these, this, it's good that there's money coming, but I feel like the, from what I'm hearing from business owners, it's just not enough, not yet. I'll be honest. I think a lot of times when they hold this press conference and they make that amount of money accessible, it's nothing more than for a political headline, because we all know anyone that can read between the lines, it's really not doing even putting a dent in trying to help some of these individuals and these businesses stay afloat because $20,000 if you've been closed since the middle of November, that's not even keeping, uh, you know, the lights on, you're not paying anyone out of that money either. Right. And you got to figure rent and the costs of, um, you know, the state has done some things. They, they um, expanded the deadline to renew liquor licenses. And I think there's been some tech sales tax deadlines that they've expanded and been lenient on. Um, but yeah, if you've got lights on, you got to keep them on. You've got to pay insurance. Um, there's a lot of costs that people don't think about. Even if you aren't open, there are still bills to pay. I wonder how this is going to reshape the city of Detroit and its restaurant scene long term because they were on such an upswing, but there was some argument that it was becoming pretty saturated as well for that downtown area. Are some of them going to close and remain closed? And is it going to have a long term impact on that restaurant scene in Detroit? Absolutely. I mean, before the pandemic, people were saying it's saturated. We saw a handful of high profile restaurants close in um, January, Gold Cash Gold in Corktown. Um, the kind of new Fort Street Galley, which was kind of a incubator, um, you know, food hall style restaurant, they they closed after about only two years. Um, Bistro 82 in Royal Oak, Green Space in Ferndale, um, Craftwork in East Vill West Village, we saw a lot of um, places that were kind of part of the fabric of the restaurant scene closed. And that was before the pandemic. So it was cutthroat. There was a lot of um, competition not just for diners but for good employees restaurant owners have told me before this and especially during this that finding people to stay on um especially you know front of house back of house managers it's been a struggle um and that was before this because there's just a lot of places opening and there's not a lot of place people that that work in the industry the, the balance isn't there yet well, I think too, what you're seeing going forward, there's been so much uncertainty in the restaurant industry. Some people are going to be leaving it altogether. Absolutely. And we've seen, we've seen that. Um, I know I've seen some people, um, you know, that I've known as a bartender or a server and they like pop up as a real estate um, uh, agent this year. Um, I've seen a lot of people leave the industry for more stable, um, you know, go back to school, get into different industries because it was, it was a hard industry. It's hard work. It's on your feet. Um, there's the different wage things with the tipping wage, um, which can be a struggle to have a consistent wage. Um, you know, a, a server make, might make twice as much in December that they will in January. So it's hard to, you know, financially stable yourself in the industry. So there's a lot of struggles. And now they're also, um, you know, they're, they're on the front lines because they're serving people, um, but they're not really in that conversation. It's like, um, people in the hospitals and grocery stores are. Oh, we had the owner of the grill on a couple of weeks ago, and you could feel the 
frustration and the anger as well from some of these business owners. Long term, just like employees are getting out of the business, do you think you're also going to see some of the owners say enough? Because even if we reopen with the vaccine, we're still looking at six, eight months, if not longer, before we reach some type of herd immunity and we get back to a normal again. I think we'll see it'll run the gamut. We'll have the diehard um, restaurant owner, bar owner that are that are going to stay and stick with it. We'll have people that can afford to just, you know, waltz into another industry, um, and we'll have people that'll pivot. Um, I think we'll see a lot more restaurants use part of their space as a market. I think we'll see a lot more online sales, a lot more shipping. Um, even buddies join Bold Belly. Uh, which is a national kind of, they ship food, regional food from all over the country. Um, I think we'll see them pivot into different styles more than the traditional restaurant where you make a reservation, you come in and you sit down. I think we'll see a lot um, of changes within the industry to accommodate less in, less indoor dining and um, more safety and something to operate with less employees too. I will say, I think one of the good things to come out of Starbucks is DoorDash now, because I remember there would be Saturday mornings, I'm like, oh, I just wish Starbucks would deliver. Well, it kind of does in a way now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I never did DoorDash or Uber Eats. I always thought, you know, I, the car's there, just go get it. Um, and now it's a whole different ball game. I feel like people have, once you've done it once or twice, maybe you buy the, the fast pass or whatever it is, you're committed to ordering more. Um, and in a note about that, it's always good to, if you do order delivery, check with the restaurant directly because those fees can really get them with the third party apps. They're very convenient and it's good for getting the restaurant's name out there. Um, but a lot of them are doing in-house delivery to avoid those fees. So if you have a favorite, I say check with them um, before because they might deliver right to your house. Yeah, it, it, because we do forget about the fees and how much they're actually getting out of that. I know some of the um, bigger restaurants here in the Kiko Harbor, Southern Lake area, they're struggling right now. But we also have a new business that has been building um, their facility. I think it's called Sylvan Table. Yeah. Uh, and I wonder what's it going to be like for some of these businesses that have been building to open, but we're in the middle of a pandemic. It's exactly. got to be um, concerning. Absolutely. And, and from what I've heard from, you know, there was supposed to be, you know, a set number of restaurants that I was expecting to open in 2020 that I was excited to see. Now it's going to be 2021. But like you said, like Sylvan Table, there's a lot of places downtown. I'm seeing there's, you know, delays with uh, city governments because people are working from home. So it's hard to get those permits, hard to get those people out there. There's delays with construction. There's delays in the supply chain. Um, but we are still seeing new places open. I, um, in today's news, I have a story on Sapino Pizzeria, which is opening a second location in New Center. And I talked to owner uh, Dave Mancini. I first heard about their second location in August 2018, and he's hoping he's going to open maybe next month. So that's February 2021. So that's a long stretch. So even without a pandemic, there was delays in getting new places off the ground. And there's a whole new set of problems. But it, one good thing about opening now is you can take into contact you can take into account safety, staffing issues, laws, regulations, um, and kind of hit the ground running when you know what to expect. Sapinos was one of my favorite restaurants to eat uh, at when I worked down in the Eastern Market area. Just about 20 seconds left here with you, and Melody, before we let you go. The top three restaurants we need to try this year. Oh, this year. Well, I'm hearing a lot about Bao Bao Fair and New Center. They're not open yet. But I'm hearing great things are going to be, like I said, partially a market, partially a juice bar, partially a cafe. I think that's going to be a really exciting new opening. I'm excited for the new Sapinos to open. And let's see, off the top of my head, um, the Beer Exchange downtown, I think, is going to be interesting. It's a beer bar. They've also got a kind of arcade space. And the beer is priced kind of like in a stock market way, where if a beer is popular, the price is going to go up. And if people aren't drinking it, it's not being ordered, the price goes down. Something different, something cool that's coming in downtown Detroit, um, hopefully in the beginning of 2021. Let's hope. Melody Baton's with us. She's the restaurant critic for the Detroit News. How can we follow you on Twitter? At Melody Baton's.
Great. Thank you so much. We want to, uh, we appreciate your time as well as your insight. Support your local restaurants because they need it now more so than ever to keep their doors open. Uh, that's going to wrap it up for the Thursday edition of the Oakland County Megacast. We'll be back here again tomorrow starting at 10 a.m. This is the Megacast. <laughs>